Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. I'm Sean Deville, joined as always by my co-host Blaine Curcio. In this week's episode, we discuss how a Chinese startup is developing satellite laser communication technologies. But first, let's discuss how China has been wrapping up the very final technology verification tests on the Chinese space station before the completion of the station later this year. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. In the latest milestone in the construction of the Chinese space station, the Chinese have conducted a transfer test with the robotic arm of the space station on the Tianzhou Two cargo spacecraft that was docked to the front docking port of the Tianhe Core module, and this took place on January sixth, twenty twenty two. Now, while this may seem like a very basic test, it was actually an indispensable one for the completion of the Chinese space station, and let's just explain why. So, for some background, the Tianhe One module of the Chinese space station was launched in April 2021, and it's the core module of the space station. It's in charge of attitude and orbital control of telemetry, and it is the living quarters of the Chinese space station. It will be joined by two additional modules, the Wenqian and the Mengqian experimental modules, which features I won't really discuss here because that's not the point of the episode. But suffice to say that these modules will significantly increase the capabilities of the space station, turning it from a 20-ton space station to a 60-ton station, and that's not taking into account the Shenzhou and the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft that are docked to it. Now, these experimental modules will be docked to the side docking ports, the multi-docking nod of the Tianhe One core module, and docking to the side ports is actually more challenging than docking to the actual ports, the front and the rear port. And for this reason, neither of the experimental modules that will be launched later this year will dock directly with the side docking ports, but rather they will first rendezvous with the front docking port that's in the actual direction, and then they'll use a small robotic arm that's included with each experimental module that's called the Liapa arm. Sort of move and slide sideways to the side docking ports. Now, of course, this maneuver can be quite perilous, and as often with very expensive space projects, there is always a backup plan. In the case of the Chinese space station, the backup is the main robotic arm of the Tianhe One core module. So, as a backup, the main robotic arm must be able to transfer the experimental modules and just any spacecraft in general that has the right connectors from one docking port to another, just in case the Liapa arms. Fail, and so what China was doing over the past week was testing exactly this capability with a Tianzhou two cargo spacecraft, and sort of testing if the main robotic arm was able to do this before giving the go ahead for the launch of Mengtian and Wentian later this year. And this is actually why the Tianzhou two cargo spacecraft is quite unique. This cargo spacecraft was launched in May 2021, and it's different from the other Tianzhou spacecraft because it was modified to have an attachment point. For the robotic arm, this is the same attachment point that would be found on Mengtian and Wentian. Now, an interesting fact on the test that took place over the past week: it was not a complete transfer as we would have expected. The Tianzhou two basically undocked, and the robotic arm performed a circular displacement, but only of roughly twenty degrees, rather than moving it completely to the side to dock. And so, basically, the Tianzhou two, after that twenty degree move, was returned to the front docking port, and it redocked with the front docking port. And so, I don't really know why that was the case. I mean. There are three potential reasons. I think the first one is that maybe something went wrong, but that's probably not the case because the CMSA said that the test was a complete success. The second reason could be that the CMSA is planning to do this in you know several steps, maybe twenty degrees first, and then、uh, a full docking in a second step. But that is probably not the case as well because the Tianzhou two is meant, I believe, to be deorbited in a couple of weeks, so that leaves very little time to perform、uh, these additional tests. And finally, the third possibility, which is probably the correct one, is that the CMSA feels. Confident that the backup capability of the main robotic arm, in terms of moving a spacecraft from the front to the side, is guaranteed with this 20-degree displacement, and so that's probably why they said that the test was a full success. 
And so, um, yeah, I think we're seeing the very final days of the Tianzhou 2 spacecraft. And speaking of that, actually, this morning, a final test took place. So we're talking about January the 8th. The Taikonauts took manual control of the Tianzhou 2 cargo spacecraft for the very first time. And they manually undocked it, made it retreat to a distance of 200 meters from the space station core module, and then back to redock with the front docking port. And so this test was successful, and I've actually even heard that this would be the final test of the Tianzhou 2 before it deorbits sometime in February. And so with that, Blaine, any any thoughts on your side on Tianzhou or just any of the things that have been going on with the Chinese space station? going to be an incredible thing to see, the, uh, the completion of that space station. And I do encourage any of you who have not checked it out to have a look at our top eight events of the Chinese space sector in 2021, where Jean gives a breakdown of the assembly of the Tianhe core module and the other components of the Chinese space station that were put into orbit last year. But definitely looking forward to watching uh, continuing updates from the space station over the course of 2022. Moving into our other piece of news for the week, it's from the commercial side of the Chinese space sector. And, uh, you know, oftentimes in China, we hear about companies that have rather interesting names. So uh, the, the typical one up to this point has been the original Chinese version of SpaceX, which is to say X space. Um, this week, however, we found a, a company perhaps taking that to an even higher level uh, with the announcement of Hi Starlink. So HI Starlink, no space, or Hi Xingguang. Yeah, uh, it is a laser intersatellite links terminal manufacturer. And they announced this week their Angel and Angel Plus rounds of funding, which apparently took place within about a month of each other over these last handful of months. They didn't actually specify the exact dates of the funding rounds. Now, these funding rounds, which we estimate would be some probably handful of million of US dollars or so, would go towards continuing development of the company's laser intersatellite link communication terminals, as well as growing the team and expanding its strategic partnerships. And it's interesting to note that the funding, these two rounds, seems to come from three mostly private venture capital firms, and two of them are, are really quite private. So we'll we'll talk more about this later, but um, interesting point to, uh, to get things started. So just a little bit more about High Starlink. So it's a very new company, having only been founded in August of 2021 with a vision of developing low-power, miniature, space-borne laser communication terminals and other core devices uh, for laser communication. And they plan on-orbit verification of their technology in the first quarter of 2022, while also planning for on-orbit verification of communication between two satellites using their technology, so not just space-to-ground, but inter-satellite links, within 2022, you know, by, by Q4. And the leadership of the company comes from a couple of different pretty blue-chip institutes, namely the CAS, Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, Tsinghua University, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, the Harbin Institute of Technology, and others. So basically a who's who of the top institutions in Chinese space. A little bit of additional digging about the company revealed a couple of interesting points. So the first is that they have apparently already already completed the development of a 40 gigabit per second ultra high speed laser communication product and a 10 gigabit per second space grade optical component product. And this makes us think that, you know, almost certainly having been founded all of six months ago, uh, they either, you know, they had help from somewhere or they had some team that was carved out from the CAS or from the HIT or from some combination thereof um, that had quite a lot of technology to start. And so the company, they, they list satellite manufacturers and other subsystems level manufacturers uh, as their, their sort of strategic partners. And its financiers and the company as well both appear to be extremely bullish on the concept of laser communications uh, for, for, you know, space to ground or from space to space uh, communications, which is you know, not particularly surprising, but an interesting point that all, all parties involved seem to be extremely bullish on laser comms for space. And so just a little bit of speculation from my side and a, bit, a little, little bit of additional analysis. So I, I think High Starlink is uh, potentially a, an example of, of a newish breed of companies in China, which is to say subsystems level space companies that are developing highly specific technologies that are perhaps already developed in research institutes or in other in universities, but that are now being commercialized. And so we've seen just over the last handful of months, a, a couple of such companies where they are spun out from some institute or entity and that they're, they're sort of tasked with commercializing a very, very specific technology. So typically the example we heard of a couple of months ago was HITSAT, which is a satellite manufacturer and component manufacturer that was spun out of the Harvard Institute of Technology with the purpose of, of commercializing their technology, as it were. Um, 
and and I think you know when we look at at High Star Link, it, it seems to be a relatively small founding team with a re, you know again private investors that seem to be putting up a relatively small amount of money to develop what is a very specific technology. Essentially, it'd be you know a, a laser terminal that would go on a satellite. The terminal is probably not much bigger than this uh, this headphone case. Um, it it it's a pretty nimble thing when you compare it to let's say a, a whole systems level rocket, and so. Again, I think we're probably going to see a, a larger number of companies like High Star Link that are small and that are relatively, you know, not so capex intensive compared with rockets, uh, and that are commercializing technologies that are, you know, very hot right now, uh, particularly in the West, but even you know, it, it globally more more generally. So, I mean, other technologies that we hear about, you know, things like electric thrusters or things like you know, liquid methylox engines. We've seen Chinese companies going in and really building those. Um, so, yeah, I think this is this is an indication of, of, of you know an increasing number of, of those companies. And and just a couple of last points on, on the topic of High Star Link and then a little bit of additional information. Um, I think it's worth comparing, say, a high star link with, say, an O Space, which was founded last year. Um, and O Space, it's a launch manufacturing company. They have a lot of facilities around Shandong Province, and they their their first round of funding was about sixty five million U S dollars. And they're planning on developing, you know, sea launch capabilities and, and lots of different things. And they have got a lot of different money from uh, large SOEs and from municipal governments. And and it was a big kind of all singing, all dancing show. And you know, again, with high star link, it, it seems like a much smaller scale operation. They're developing a a very specific technology. Um, it it doesn't. It's not as capex intensive. It's not as polluting. I, I suppose if you want to look at it from an environmental perspective. And, and so again, I, I think that you're going to see a lot more emphasis on these companies developing very specific technologies. And I think ultimately, when we look at this new dynamic of a, a large number of relatively small companies developing very specific technologies, you're going to see certain cities benefit more than others. So if we look at large scale rocket manufacturing, for example, the cities that are most likely to try to attract that are cities that are not particularly dense and not particularly uh, developed and you know it, it's not very convenient for your city to have a huge rocket testing range within its 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 area i mean most you know primarily less developed cities with more space would be doing that but if we look at a technology like laser intersatellite links it's a very research intensive and not particularly large scale footprint type of technology and i think that, uh, that one of the cities that's probably going to benefit is the city where high star link has decided to set up its headquarters uh, notably shenzhen and so just to, to close out the week we saw one additional article um, on the topic of the shenzhen space ecosystem that i think kind of dovetails nicely with this topic and i think the piece discusses uh, in, in the context of shenzhen that you have these you know many different local state-owned space companies, so uh, Shenzhen Aerospace, Dongfang Hong, and APT Mobile Satellite being two examples, as well as different commercial companies, so various Beidou um, equipment manufacturing companies, for example, and then the city government, which is providing incentives primarily in terms of you know tax incentives and, and other uh, employee salary benefits, this type of thing. And as we've noted many times before, um, I think what we may see with High Starlink is a kind of a, a collaboration between the sort of trifecta of different stakeholders in the sector. So we have High Star Link as this commercial company that is commercializing a specific technology. We have, for example, the city of Shenzhen on the government side that's providing favorable policies. And then we could, you know, conceivably have a company like Shenzhen Aerospace Dongfang Hong, which makes small satellites that would say, we want to integrate some of your laser intersatellite link uh, terminals onto our satellites. And so again, having the SOE, the, the government, and then the commercial company creating this trifecta and um, and you know creating innovation, I, I think is um, is possible here. So definitely a lot to uh, a lot to watch out for, and um, a lot going on in uh, in places like Shenzhen. Uh, John, anything from your side on, uh, on High Star Link or, uh, or or these related topics? Yeah, just to go back to your point on uh, High Star Link, I think it's interesting to note that they're the second company, commercial company, as far as I know, to be designing um, laser communication modules. The first one being Nanjing Intian, and we reported nobly in December 2020 that they had been testing their laser communication modules on a space platform that was launched in December 2020. I think this raises also the question of who will be using these laser communication modules. Among the companies that will very likely or 100% sure be using laser communications, we have Xingyun, the Xingyun constellation, a narrowband constellation that's being designed by KASIC. KASIC notably launched two Xingyun satellites in 2020, and they tested laser interlink technologies during that year. So we know that Xingyun will be using laser interlinks. And more recently, we reported in November 2021 
uh, about a company called Hualu Space, which is planning to build geo relay satellites that would use laser interlinks between the relay satellites and the satellites in Leo. And finally, I think it's reasonable to think that China's equivalent of Starlink, the so-called Guoan constellation, will very likely also use laser interlinks, probably for performance reasons. And this is also why Starlink is using you know, laser interlinks for their latest generation satellites. But the other reason probably also is that it is very challenging to have a global uh, network of ground stations and even more so for China for geopolitical reasons. That's probably why they would go also for laser interlinks. And this is something that was suggested by Tan Jun, which is one of the investors into the Chinese company High Starlink. And so he recognizes this difficulty and that's probably why he's very bullish on laser interlinks and why he's investing in this company. So yeah, any Blaine, any final, final thoughts on uh, laser interlinks or... Just any of the updates from this week? Um, not a lot from my side. Just a special thanks to our most recent supporters who have gone and bought us some coffees at buymeacoffee.com slash Hour. Notably, that would include Tian Huang Cornucopia, who left a very nice message for us, and one very kind anonymous donor. Uh, also, a special shout out to our good friends at spacewatch.global and Go Taikonauts, two excellent sources of space industry news. And that's about all from my side. Um, yeah, thanks very much, and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thank you for listening. 